right, I think we'll get underway. So um, I've been nominated to be the chair of this session. Uh, collective decision here. Um, our first presenter and the top of this, of this session is social equity, environment, and distribution. Our first presenter is going to be Peter Victor, a professor at York University, and he's going to talk to us, talk to us about uh, three dichotomies uh, that relate to the topic of the session. So, or his own work, I should say. <laughs> okay, Peter. Welcome. Thank you, Mark, Andre. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so, I'm going to talk about uh, three dichotomies that relate very much to the kind of work I've been doing for quite some time, which focuses primarily on the relationship between the economy and the environment. That's not to say that the other aspects, social equity and distribution, don't enter into my work, but um, with a short amount of time, I, just, I thought I would just pick three, uh, three dichotomies to, to put before you for discussion. So um, first is how we think about the economy in relation to the environment. The second is... Uh, a dichotomy that often emerges between discussions of scale, the size of the economy, how fast it's growing, and intensity, some measure of performance of the economy. And third um, uh, is this uh, focus we usually make just on how much energy is our economy producing as an output, whereas we need also to look at energy input, and then so that net energy is what we focus on. So those are the three dichotomies I wanted to mention. The first. Economy and environment. That's kind of a nice graphic that I picked off the internet. I didn't make it up, um, but I thought it was pretty good. You know, the idea that these things just go in different directions. They're often discussed by different communities of people. Uh, and uh, what I think is so important, especially these days, is that when we are working as economists, we never lose sight of the fact that the economy is embedded in the biosphere. So um, here's an example of, of what happens when you, you do lose sight of the fact of that. Uh, that's a headline at the top that was in our uh, Global Mail, Canada's national newspaper, I suppose, uh, Monday of this week, which uh, talks about the, um, the turnaround, apparently, in, the, in oil production in, uh, in the U.S., that we're going, the U.S. is going to be a net exporter in 2020, and they refer to the World Energy Outlook as the report from which this came. So I took a quick look at the report, at least the executive summary, which is online, and um, found something else that's in the report. No more than one-third of proven, of proven reserves of fossil fuels can be consumed prior to 2050 if the world is to achieve the two-degree centigrade warming goal unless carbon capture and storage technology is widely deployed. I don't think that last um, exception is, or unless, is likely to happen, which means that the first part of that sentence is a really important qualifier on this... Um, change perhaps in the energy predicament of, of the U.S. because a lot of companies and in other parts of the world, a lot of co countries um, are looking presumably at a massive uh, write-down of the assets of their economies and their firms if it turns out that two-thirds, and that's an underestimate perhaps, uh, of the proven fossil fuels, already what's known, uh, cannot be used. So Clearly, we must have a more comprehensive picture of things if we're to avoid this kind of dichotomy. So here's just a reminder. Open up pretty much any textbook on economics uh, we use to introduce our students to economics. You get a picture of, uh, of an economy that looks like this, and we spend a lot of time talking about how that functions. And um, the problem with it from the point of view of someone like myself interested in environment is there is no environment. So I make it move, to make it look prettier, but that's not really what I want to do with it. What I want to do is fill in uh, key aspects of the whole system that are missing from this picture. So for this cycle to run, we know that it has to have a continual inflow of materials and energy that are drawn from natural systems. And from some fundamental physical laws, we also know that whatever is drawn into the economy and into economic processes is disposed of uh, as waste ultimately back into the environment. And now we've got two sets of major problems here. One is on the resource input side, which I've alluded to. One is also on the fact that we're overloading uh, um, many of the natural systems by our increasing use of of uh, the environment for waste disposal. And so what happens is we start interfering with the biophysical cycles which define the way the planet runs and that's all taking place on planet Earth. So this is the picture of the economy, of economies. I think economists have to internalize. Uh, and it doesn't do just to talk about what's going on in that economic cycle because we are having um, increasingly measurable and adverse impacts on the larger system. Some data. 
This graph shows global materials extraction from 1900 to 2005. In other words, all of the materials we've had to draw into the world's economies, and of course each economy has a different story to tell, but I'm, this is a kind of a 20 minute special. Um, here's what happened in the first half of the 20th century. A, a gentle increase, a gradual increase in, in the intake of construction materials, ores and industrial materials, fossil energy carriers, so fossil fuels, and biomass. But then look what happened in the second half of the 20th century, up to 2005. An absolutely massive increase in the rate at which we're extracting resources from the, uh, from the environment to keep our system going. It's not surprising, therefore, that we're encountering planetary boundaries. I'm not going to read them all, but there's climate change, ocean acidification. The red one you can't see very well is the nitrogen cycle. Over here we have biodiversity loss. This comes from quite a well-known paper now in Nature from 2009. The green circle in the middle symbolizes the safe operating space for humanity, uh, sort of the extent to which we can occupy the biophysical space on the planet and leave uh, room for others. But we're pushing out beyond that boundary, with, at least with respect to three of those. We must, I think, therefore have in mind when we're doing our economic work the interaction between the economy and the environment. Right, the second false dichotomy between scale and intensity. This is a picture of the world's largest cruise ship. It's an amazing piece of equipment, um, but I just want to point out what, how it was described and is described by the company that made this um, ship. I would say this is the most environmentally friendly ship, cruise ship to date much more efficient than other similar ships. And of course, what they're looking at is, I suppose, the energy per person if this, place was, if this um, ship was filled. Uh, but when this ship arrives at a small Caribbean island and thousands of passengers get off, plus the crew, uh, it's not very friendly to the environment at all. Um, and it's an example of what happens if you just think about environmental friendliness in terms of efficiency and not in terms of scale. Um, so, some people look to decoupling as the way forward. In other words, we'll continue to grow the economy, that rising GDP, decouple resource use, you can see how it's declining over time in this hypothetical scenario, and then further decouple environmental impact from resources. This is a way of characterizing green growth. But if you look at the data of the last uh, 20, <coughs> 25 years um, and see, well, how are we doing using essentially the same structure, this is global data. And you see that global GDP has been rising, global energy has been rising, and global carbon dioxide has been rising. Not as fast, so relative decoupling, but we're not dropping down. We're increasing the burden we place on the planet to support our economic growth. Uh, here's high-income countries. And here's low- and middle-income countries with a a different scale, so it's actually even more pronounced than I've suggested there. So I've begun, uh, well, some time ago to think about this scale and intensity issue, and I found the following graphic quite useful. I put uh, intensity, greenhouse gases per unit of GDP on the horizontal axis, and GDP on the upright axis, and this is data for Canada. There was our GDP in 1990, the base year for Kyoto. There was our greenhouse gas intensity for the same year, and you multiply the two together, you get the total output of greenhouse gases, which we could have got from a larger economy and a more efficient one, or a smaller economy and a less efficient one. Any combination of intensity and scale along the red line would give us the same uh, output of greenhouse gases. And you can see where we would be lower and where we would be higher. Well, I use this to define green growth. We started out in 1990 at that 589 megaton mark. Green growth would be a transition into that green triangle. But we could also have brown growth, where we would be having a larger economy, more efficient in this sense, but the efficiency is not increasing fast enough to compensate for the increase in scale. There's, a, there's black growth and here's some degrowth. Well, now we can try it and see what happened in terms of actual data. This is the US situation starting in 1990, and every dot I'm going to put on the graph now shows what they did year after year. And you can see that uh, it's a world of brown growth, economic growth, but intensity declining, but not fast enough to compensate for that. Here's Britain. Now, Britain had a Kyoto target. They said they'd get down somewhere onto that uh, on the purple line. What did they do? They managed to do it. 
Sort of. They did it because they switched the gas to a large extent, and secondly, the structure of their imports changed. They started importing a lot of CO2 intensive products. Canada, well, we were like Britain in the sense that we had a Kyoto target, but we behaved rather like the Americans. In fact, um, on a proportional basis, quite a lot worse. So now that takes us to pretty much where we are now, 2010. The data is always a couple of years old when it comes to greenhouse gases. So we can take that as our starting point and say what would happen if we wish to achieve a substantial reduction in greenhouse gas emission releases, I put 87% over 50 years, get onto that purple curve. Um, could we do that by green growth? Well, green growth is anywhere in that green triangle. If we did it with no growth, it means we move just along the horizontal line. We have to get our intensity down just to 0.07 um, kilotons of greenhouse gases per million dollars of GDP. That would require a decarbonization rate of 4% a year. The intensity would only be 13% 50 years from now compared with today. That's an incredible accomplishment. And that's with no growth. If you have 2% growth, in other words, you bring the scale uh, dimension into it, you've got to decarbonize at 6% a year to reach that target. And at a 3% growth, essentially got to squeeze all greenhouse gases out of every dollar of output of the economy. So clearly, this is an example of showing how environmental impact is the combination of the scale of the activity causing the problem and the intensity. And too, many, too much focus is placed just on intensity. The third false dichotomy, energy output and energy input. Well, there's a, quite a popular measure that's used in the sort of literature I read called the energy return on investment, which is simply energy output over energy input. And this shows data for a number of different energy technologies. Of course, there's a, a certain level of uncertainty about the, the range of these, but you can see on the far left, domestic oil, this is US data, in 1930 had an energy return on investment of about 100. It was very easy to get your hands on that energy. You come over to the right-hand side at some of the more the technologies that we're looking to as technologies of the future, you can see that the energy return on investment is way lower. There's a um, little bit of a formula there, net energy defined as energy out minus energy in. The energy return on investment is just one divided by the other. So it turns out that net energy is, can be related to the energy return on investment. Now, we hear a lot about the fiscal cliff. There's also the net energy cliff because what happens is as your energy return on investment declines, when it's declining from a high, a high number like 100 or 90, it makes virtually no difference to the amount of net energy you get as compared with gross energy. But when you reach a value of about 8 to 1, you see what happens, that the proportion of energy that we have to spend to get our hands on energy becomes uh, increasingly large very fast. So this is just another example of how we can't just look at one thing when another thing is important. It's a false dichotomy. And I suspect, oh no, I haven't quite finished. Right, so this is my closing slides, I suppose. Um, this seems to me to be the main focus of, of the conference which is to understand in better terms than we've ever done in the past the relationships between the financial economy and the real economy. And it's where I think INET puts a lot of its resources. Uh, most of the work that I've done over the years has been at this end of the, of the spectrum, looking at the relationship between uh, natural systems and the real economy. But I do think that the, the way forward is to include all three, and I would now at this point want to acknowledge the support that I and my colleague Tim Jackson are getting from INET and CG to uh, build a macro model which is ambitious enough in scope that it encompasses all three of these elements. But that's the topic for another presentation. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Peter. That was great. Um, next talk uh, is Ross McKittrick, professor at University of Guelph. And Ross is going to talk to us about equity in the environment. Thanks, Mark Andre. Uh, we were lamenting just before the session that we didn't have a whole lot of advanced time to put our talks together, and Peter said, oh, I just threw this together last night, and I'd love to see a presentation that he actually had time to put together at, at this rate. Um, so now I need to escape from this. There's no escape. Uh, when you see my slides, you may wish we could just go back to Peter's. Um, these genuinely were thrown together. Now, the other thing we're complaining about is how sensitive this mouse is, so it may take a while for me to, there we go. 
Excel. Here we go. All right. I, um, one, one point to begin with is, is uh, I'd kind of like the word environment to be abolished from scholarly vocabulary because it's so big, it just covers way too much. Basically, it covers everything from that door to outer space. And um, it's not one thing. Environment is, is hundreds of things. It's thousands of things. And as soon as you look at any aspect of it, uh, the gradations of, of complexity just expand. So even if we talk about emissions to the atmosphere, air emissions, uh, there are important categories there. And, and the categories matter. So um, I'm mostly... Uh, in preparing this talk, I'm mostly talking about conventional urban air pollution. And uh, so that'll be apparent when you see my slides. But that's not to say that the points I'll make regarding air pollution will, would carry over to all forms of water pollution, for instance, or would carry over to all forms of uh, um, greenhouse gases or land use effects or things like that. So. Um, uh, with regard to any environmental issue, I, I just uh, encourage you to bear in mind that the categories matter and uh, the word itself is way too big at this point to be informative. So um, I want to try to say something about equity. I want to try to get my slide to go forward first and then I'll say something about equity. There we go. Um, and when we talk about equity and the environment, there are two sides to consider. One is the distribution of the benefits of environmental quality and the distribution of the costs of environmental quality, or sorry, the distribution of the costs of environmental policy. And I'm going to conjecture the existence of another environmental Kuznets curve. Now, if you don't know the term environmental Kuznets curve, uh, picture a, a graph where on the horizontal axis it's uh, per capita income. And uh, on the vertical axis, there's some measure of pollution levels, uh, air pollution or water pollution. And uh, there's a profile that emerges in some international data sets where as income grows, uh, pollution levels go up at low income levels. And then um, they max out at a certain point. And then as income continues to grow, uh, the pollution levels begin to go down as income gets higher and higher. So this profile shows up in certain types of urban air contaminants and uh, water quality indicators. Uh, not all. Some of them, it's a more of a monotonic downward sloping relationship, especially with particulates. Others, it's more of a monotonic upward sloping relationship, like uh, carbon dioxide. But um, there are many intermediate cases where you have an upward sloping portion, you hit the turnaround at a medium income level, and then you get on the downward sloping portion. So I want to suggest there's a... Uh, an, a nonlinear relationship of the same kind where we have equity on the vertical axis and the stringency of policy on the horizontal axis. So that at low levels of stringency of policy, uh, improvements in environmental equality are also improving social equity. Uh, that the distribution of the costs and benefits of policy are favorable to low income groups or to the relatively low income groups. But then we hit a certain point where we enter what I would call a kind of overkill on any one particular environmental axis. And there the risk is that policy continues to get more stringent, but the distribution now of costs and benefits become unfavorable to social equity. And I'm going to give examples of where I think we're in danger of, of getting onto the downward sloping portion in terms of the relationship between stringency of policy and equity. An example of the upward sloping policy would be, I think, the rapidly growing Asian economies. Uh, I was talking a couple of weeks ago to a health economist from Vietnam who was speaking at our university, and, and when he found out I do environmental economics, he, he right away wanted to begin talking about these uh, communities in the, the country that he grew up in where they are getting rapid economic growth, but there's serious environmental stresses, and there's basically no policy support. There's, there's no enforcement of whatever policies might be on the books. And this is a common story in a lot of these kinds of rapidly growing Asian communities. Uh, and also post-war North America, there were uh, similar kinds of dynamics where the focus was on getting economic and industrial growth. Uh, environmental protection would have to wait. And so um, as a result, uh, heavy pollution burdens emerged, and um, then over time, as the policies became more stringent, uh, the, uh, the, the, the benefits were spread quite widely. The costs, because there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in terms of gains from policy, uh, meant that the, um, uh, 
uh, the benefits and costs were favorably distributed. Um, so the two examples I'm going to go into in, in a bit of detail, Ontario Air Quality and the Green Energy Act, and second, the Madupi Power Plant in South Africa. And both of these examples, I'm going to argue, is uh, modern environmentalism is increasingly becoming an indulgence of wealthy communities who are shielded from the costs of the policies that they're imposing or that they're advocating for. So Ontario air quality, uh, I want to set the stage by looking at Toronto air quality data. Uh, the data that I'll show you come from a couple of sources. Uh, we have a national archive called NAPS, National Air Pollution Surveillance System, um, which is a network of um, provincially run air quality monitoring stations, and then the data goes through a secondary quality control process before being archived at Environment Canada. Um, the earliest data that uh, we have for Toronto goes back to 1962. The NAPS archive begins in 1974, so I have the Ontario Ministry of Environment data for before that. And you'll see a blue arrow on the, the diagram there, which shows uh, the National Ambient Air Quality Standard, uh, desirable standard for um, uh, each air, uh, type of air contaminant. And these are monthly averages. Uh, if you're interested in air quality, and some of us are, uh, I mean, as an academic subject, we're all interested, presumably, in air quality for air quality's sake. You can look at Ontario air quality readings all across the province in real time at a, a website called air Qual airqualityontario.com. And um, uh, so I like to uh, check these readings just for interest sake, but also for public talks. I encourage people um, that uh, we actually do measure this stuff, measure it all across the province, and you can get hourly updates around the clock. Okay, this is um, total suspended particulates in downtown Toronto. And you can see the beginning in 1962 and throughout the 1960s, a typical reading would have been in the range of 200 micrograms per cubic meter. And um, uh, there's a downward sloping trend back in the 1960s. Uh, and that downward sloping trend would have uh, begun back in the 1950s for most North American cities. Um, by the time we get into the 1980s, the typical readings now are between 50 and 100 micrograms per cubic meter. And then there's a gap in the record there, unfortunately, in the late 90s. But it picks up again. Uh, my, my graph ends at uh, the end of 1998. But the readings would continue right up to the present and will typically be between 30 and 50 micrograms per cubic meter. So the, um, uh, the particular levels in Toronto, and this will be typical for most Ontario cities, certainly most North American cities, Hamilton would be a little bit higher because of the steel mills being so close to downtown. But a lot of cities in North America and Europe, the particulate levels have been brought down to levels below the, um, the targets. Uh, this is the sulfur dioxide record. It's even more dramatic change there. 100 parts per billion would be a typical reading in the 60s. By the mid-70s, with the closure of uh, some of the large um, uh, power generating units close to downtown and a few other uh, improvements. Uh, the readings are down to about the 25 parts per billion range. Today a typical reading in downtown Toronto and any place in Ontario, there are only five places where it's even monitored anymore, it would be between zero and five parts per billion um, in, uh, in Toronto air. And this would be typical for cities right across Canada as well, except for out west you never had the early years of the high readings, they were always much lower, but now um, with, uh, uh, with the various regulatory initiatives, even Sudbury would have low sulfur dioxide levels um, on a daily basis. Uh, ozone levels, now ozone is a different story because it's not directly emitted by polluters. It's, it's formed by a chemical reaction involving precursor emission, so that makes it more difficult to control. What you can see here is um, Long term, going back to the early 1970s, there, uh, the average has been fairly stable. There's a strong seasonal cycle to it. Um, the average went down up to the mid-1990s. It's stayed flat or has gone up slightly. But what's changed is we don't get these high peaks the way we used to. So the, um, the typical reading for an Ontario city would be somewhere between 10 and 30 parts per billion uh, on an hourly basis. But on um, uh, really hot summer days with a temperature inversion, uh, the conditions are there for ozone to go up. The spikes used to go up to over 50 parts per billion. Uh, that's very rare now. And um, typically for a North American city, uh, even on the, the spike days, uh, the levels don't go up um, uh, to the, that blue line 
uh, with any regularity. Uh, the uh, NO2 levels, now NO2 is one of the precursors for ozone formation, that's why it's, it's monitored. And here you can see again, uh, not the dramatic change that happened with sulfur, NO2 is harder to control just as a technical um, challenge. It requires improving the efficiency of, of the burn, not just sticking a, a scrubber on a smokestack. But um, uh, gradually, since the 1970s, the trend has been downward and, and has remained fairly stable, so that compliance with NO2 is not really an issue. Um, these days, in Ontario anyway, compliance as far as uh, air quality targets is really focused on ozone and aerosols, and both of those are not directly emitted, they're, they're formed through chemical reactions in the air. And so, um, and they're not straightforward to control. So for instance, ozone is uh, formed by a reaction between volatile organic compounds and NOx, or NO2, um, but it's not a simple matter of reducing one or the other, because if you reduce one without reducing the other, under certain circumstances, that could actually increase ozone formation. And it's also not necessarily an urban issue because ozone levels tend to drop in cities relative to the surrounding countryside uh, for other reasons to do with the local chemistry. Um, so anyway, the background here is um, a lot of progress, especially in the 70s and 80s, in controlling air pollution in Ontario. So that brings us to the Green Energy Act of 2009. And, um, at that time that it was being talked about, there were no general compliance problems for air quality in Ontario. And there was a reasonable balance of benefits and costs. In other words, a lot of benefits in terms of reduced particulate loads, reduced sulfur dioxide loads, uh, keeping uh, NOx levels down, and controlling those ozone spikes at costs that were pretty manageable, in terms, especially in terms of uh, the energy sector. The Green Energy, effect, the Green energy Act, um, Therefore, at best, given its stated intentions of improving air quality, could only have achieved trivial changes to what were already low air pollution levels, and was going to do so through large regressive increases in energy costs, primarily through promoting uh, the expansion of uh, the wind energy sector and uh, solar power. And uh, with regards to wind energy, on a political scale here, the thing is, it's not something that affects urban areas. Urban areas are shielded from the disamenities of installation of wind turbines. So uh, I look at this as an example now where going into the overkill range on air quality through the Green Energy Act uh, was socially regressive. Now, um, let me illustrate uh, the, uh, the sort of core motivation of the Green Energy Act was to get rid of the Lampton and Nanticoke generating stations. This is a diagram available on um, the Ontario Ministry of Energy website showing the locations of all the major power plants in the U.S. Northeast scaled by their sulfur dioxide emissions, uh, which is, would be a proxy for um, uh, some other types of emissions as well, um, including particulates. Now let me take Lampton and Nanticoke out of that picture for you. and. If you missed it, I'll do that again. So right off the bat, even without showing any calculations, it's kind of implausible to think that this is going to have a huge effect on Ontario air quality. Um, going into more detail, uh, the good folks over at RWDI in Guelph, which is an air quality and engineering um, analysis firm, did some simulations for the provincial government of what would happen in ozone episodes or smog episodes if the Lampton and Nanticoke generating stations were, were gone. And in the immediate vicinity of the power plants, there would be uh, noticeable reductions in ozone and particulates, but only about 10%, 10 to 15%. The rest of the province, the effects on ozone would be less than 1% of current levels and less than 5% of fine particulates. These are very small changes given the costs of shutting those power plants down to, to the province. If we look at it, on the other side of what's happened to electricity prices in Ontario, uh, I took this yesterday from um, the website of the independent electricity system operator. The wholesale electricity price in Ontario on a typical day is little under three cents per kilowatt hour. That's the generating cost. And that's based on the um, operating mix that you see there. Uh, nuclear providing about half the power, hydro, gas, and coal providing the rest, and wind energy for all the money that's been spent on it there is providing a mighty 16 uh, megawatts or um, eight one hundredths of one percent of our electricity yesterday. Um, 
The second term there is the global adjustment, which is a flat addition to the electricity price to pay for uh, the projects initiated under the Green Energy Act. And uh, so that's sort of the subsidy component. It's now running, as you can see, it's getting close to twice the wholesale price of electricity, and it will be going up in the years ahead. And then the chart over on the left there is now the retail price of electricity. We used to pay about five cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, the uh, daytime regular rates now uh, are um, in the morning and the afternoon are 11.8 cents per kilowatt hour. During the day, 11 to 5, it's uh, just under 10 cents, and then overnight it goes to 6 cents. So households are now paying quite a bit more for electricity, and this is to pay for the um, change in the mix required by shutting down Lambton and Nanticoke. Now, this graph here just shows uh, some standard calculations about the distribution of costs when you increase energy prices uh, ranked by uh, household incomes. Um, because of uh, energy being a, an essential good rather than a luxury good, um, when energy prices go up, the effect is regressive across households. So um, the, uh, the distribution of the cost burden will be proportionately higher for low-income households. As a result, the province has now put in um, what's called the Green Energy Benefit, which is a 10% reduction in power bills to try to soften the blow. Um, that creates a problem then of, of the um, uh, adding about $1.5 billion to the uh, provincial deficit each year, so it, it may not survive, but it's really a patch on a problem that was created by another policy, um, which was to force up energy prices. And then we have the urban versus rural effects here. Um, on the left, uh, offshore wind, uh, the province has, has announced a moratorium on offshore wind project developments, and that was a rising, uh, the, the big push for that was property owners in Scarborough uh, didn't like the prospect of the big wind farms going offshore and were very effective in lobbying for a moratorium on that. On the right, it's an article of which there are many now in the province talking about landowners and how they're affected in rural areas by these arrivals of very large wind turbine operations. This particular one is interviewing a couple in, near London, Ontario, who uh, built their dream home out in the countryside, woke up one day to find out there's going to be 40 wind turbines in the farm behind them. Now they can't sell their property, nobody wants to buy it, and they want to get out of there, but essentially they've, they've lost a huge amount of their wealth um, because of this. Um, so that's the first example, and, and the lesson there is um, uh, the environmental policy if all we were interested in was, was air quality, we'd, we'd achieved a good balance of, of reductions in pollution um, with a reasonable cost burden associated with it. Then we moved into this overkill uh, range where um, uh, this, this sort of unnecessary and extremely expensive uh, further reductions in air pollution were being pushed by people who were able to shield themselves to a large extent from the, the, the cost of the policy. Another example from a very different part of the world is uh, South Africa, and that's actually a picture from Kenya, I believe, but it illustrates that for a lot of rural areas in the third world, their big air pollution issue is indoor air pollution. Uh, the fact that they rely on indoor coal and wood and, and dung fires uh, to heat their homes and get some lighting uh, causes a huge amount of, a huge burden on public health, lung disease, cancer, COPD, cataracts, low birth weight, and then also regional environmental problems of, of haze formation and also uh, local deforestation. So the solution for people in that situation is the same as it was for people in uh, early days in Ontario and the US and, and everywhere else, which is electrification. Building power plants, getting the lines out, and getting people to start adopting electrical appliances for lighting and heating and cooking. Uh, to do that, you need to build power plants. And uh, this is happening in, in uh, countries in, in Africa. Um, this is a picture of uh, the Madupi power plant under construction in South Africa. Now, mega projects in the third world may have all kinds of goofy economics, so I don't mean to suggest that this would make sense on a cost-benefit basis, uh, but the investors behind it believe it, it uh, would. Um, the issue, though, was South Africa is building a large coal-fired power plant in, um, in part to bring electricity to a region of the continent uh, 
that was suffering a lot of blackouts and had uh, inadequate power supplies. And it's a 4,800 megawatt uh, power plant being built with Western engineering. It's, it's, um, um, uh, it's what's called a dry cooled um, boilers that operate at high intensity, so it's a very efficient operation. Um, and they sought funding from the World Bank to help uh, finance this. Uh, the financing was approved, but only after a lobby, uh, a very intense lobby, largely European environmental groups and the governments of the US, the UK, Denmark, and the Netherlands joined in opposing uh, the loan. Uh, in the end, the board of the World Bank uh, did approve it, but it was a narrow approval. But as I watched that, uh, that whole campaign, I was struck by the role of Western environmental groups in opposing um, uh, the power plant, not because they weren't saying uh, financing doesn't make sense because the plant will run at a loss and it's bad for the economy. That wasn't their argument. They assumed that it would be good for the regional economy, but they said it would be, uh, we shouldn't do this because it's going to burn coal and there'll be air emissions and, and greenhouse gas emissions. And, and yet, the potential benefits from improving the uh, power grid in, in Africa seem to me uh, it's a no-brainer that this is, that would improve social equity. So my concern uh, on the equity front here from both these examples and to whatever extent they generalize, but I don't uh, try to generalize too far, is that the calls for ever tighter restrictions on any one axis along uh, environmental issues tends to come from wealthy urban Westerners who are personally shielded from many of the costs of the implementation and are motivated by this warm glow that they feel from the policy, even if they can't articulate uh, the actual numerical benefits of the policy that they would argue for, uh, the, the resort instead to slogans and generalities. I see this with the Ontario air, air pollution story where um, it sometimes comes as a surprise to people to find out we actually monitor this stuff and measure it, let alone what the levels are. And as a result, my concern is that we get on the downward sloping portion of this relationship. Uh, we get into the overkill region where further stringency is actually uh, depleting social equity. Thank you. Great, thanks, Ross. Um, so now we're going to proceed to the final presentation, which is mine. And I'm just going to see if I can navigate. <coughs> All right, so um, I'm going to approach this topic of the session from a little bit of a different perspective, perspective of income inequality. And uh, I have to throw out a few caveats before I get going. Um, similar to my uh, co-panelists, this was a bit of a last minute thing. Um, it's also a very kind of embryonic kind of thought process I'm putting forward toward, for you today. And finally, I'm drawing from work of other people. So it's really kind of a, a bricolage. I'm pulling together threads from other kinds of research that I've been um, reading lately and trying to make a, a bit of a coherent story out of that. So that's, that's my, uh, my caveat before we go forward. And I'm going to start with a chart that really kind of sets up what I want to talk to you about today. Um, and this is a chart by Mike Veal, who's kind enough to share, me, share with me this chart. Um, and some of you may have seen it before. He, he was the... Um, president of the Canadian Economics Association uh, this past year, and he talked, his presidential talk um, leaned heavily on this chart. And so what this chart is showing, I think it's not altogether surprising, is the income share of the top 1%. And when he talks about income share, he's talking about all income except excluding capital gains. And the pattern is um, fairly familiar, I guess. You had the kind of golden, gilded age of the 1920s and 30s. Uh, well, not the 30s, but the 20s, and then the, you know, the kind of the post-war period where the income distribution started flattening, and then we hit the uh, kind of 80s uh, period, and it starts kind of going back to the 1920s pattern. Um, and so what's interesting from a Canadian perspective is we like to think that the Canadian story is so much better, but uh, in fact, the trends are roughly similar to what we're seeing in the United States. Um, and what Mike does in his talk and his paper that was just published in the Canadian Journal of Economics is kind of say, okay, well, here's what we're seeing. Now let's look at some possible causal stories behind this, this, this pattern. And, um, and one of the stories, I'll just kind of quickly rhyme off of the stories he talks about and then take you to the one that I find most interesting for my purposes and where I'm coming from. So first of all, he talks about globalization. Maybe globalization is driving this process. 
uh, kind of a Me Tooism with the U.S. kind of leading global patterns in terms of income distribution. He kind of finds some evidence for that, but is not overly enthused, I would say, about that view. He also talks about the skill bias, technological change. Maybe these are rewards for incredible abilities by CEOs and directors and executives. And he kind of dismisses that view as well by showing contrasting evidence for different well-developed countries, Japan and, say, for example, France, who don't have these same patterns, are, who are also, however, very much at the t technological frontier, if you want to think in those terms. Um, so he kind of says, you know, that's probably not it either. He looks at tax change, policy, policy changes on the tax side, says, yeah, that probably accounts for some of what we're seeing here, um, but doesn't feel too comfortable with that story either. And then he finally kind of lands on a story about corporate change, so change in corporate behavior, uh, whereby executives are getting rewarded in kind of unprecedented ways um, for their, their, their work. And uh, again, he's saying most of this behavior is being driven by wages and salaries, not so much um, kind of investment income, although that's some part of the story. And again, keep in mind, this doesn't include capital gains kind of uh, income. So that's, that's the story, and I want to kind of really take apart that corporation, because I think that's a really interesting theme. It's something I've been engaging with. I work for the cooperative sector, and so I've been starting to think more about what these forms mean uh, and how they kind of um, affect economic outcomes. So I want to talk about the corporation. I've called this slide, you know, the origins of species, because there's a very conventional story about how the corporation came to be. And that, corp that story is essentially the corporation is a kind of the solution to a, a problem of uh, transaction costs around acquiring information about prices and terms uh, under which trades would take place, the costs of negotiating, uh, uncertainty about future states of the world. So the firm kind of internalizes these costs and, and comes embedded with a kind of command and control structure that you have a very unified decision-making rule, profit maximization, there's no divisiveness within the institution, and you're all set to go into your standard microeconomics kind of um, principles. Um, some of the key things to keep in mind with that kind of very standard way of thinking of the firm is that the owner or the small group of owners, fully aligned owners, uh, own the firm's assets. Um, they receive residual income, right? That's another key thing. They employ inputs. They bear the risks. That's probably the most important thing that I would kind of stress right now. And they control the firm in a very clear and unproblematic way. So that there's a kind of a bit of a black box in the corporate form because um, while what that description says is largely true for sole proprietorships and maybe partnerships, it's a lot less true for large corporations. So you've had Oliver Williamson and these transaction school economists who kind of taken apart that black box and said, no, let's look inside that black box and see what's going on. And there they, they identify kind of things like principal agent problems. How do you get these kind of very dispersed shareholders to kind of make sure management is respecting their will? So that's the kind of next evolution in this, in this kind of thinking about the corporation. And then after that, there's this kind of nexus of contract view, which says really the corporation is just this collection of contracts between uh, management, between owners and labor, owners and suppliers, owners and customers, and so on. And that, that view um, kind of finds its way into some micro textbooks. I, I just pulled out my old um, master's degree textbook and, and found a, a quote where the, the, the authors say, although the firm can be regarded as a complex of contracts, activities are really, and they kind of say really and implicitly, are organized through a system of authority and control rather than through kind of market transactions. So they're kind of, they say, yeah, you can see this thing as a, as a nexus of contracts, but they don't really kind of give it much weight in their discussion. Um, and just to kind of illustrate very simply what we mean by the nexus of contracts, you, this is the idea, essentially. Except that Bob is really a joint stock corporation with mil many million, hundreds of thousands of shareholders, perhaps. Um, and that's where the principal agents problems kind of arise. So what I want to kind of say about this is, um, it's really interesting that the nexus of contracts views has become, while it's not dominant in the kind of micro textbook stories that we that would teach students, it is very prevalent or important in legal kind of circles, in, in actual court cases. And this, this actual, a lot of that kind of work around nexus of contracts view arose from legal scholars who were kind of dabbling in economics and pairing up with some of these transaction economist guys. So this view is actually quite important in that kind of more pragmatic world, the policy world, the court, in the, in the court system. Um, and so where I'm coming at this from a bit of a critical perspective is I'm leaning heavily on the work of somebody named Patty Ireland, 
Um, also Joel Buchan a little bit, but more Patty Ireland. I think he's kind of more rigorous scholar. And he says, you know, this kind of nexus of contracts view that the firm is this collection of contracts between roughly equal parties is uh, deeply at odds with the historical evidence. Um, the historical evidence is that the firm back in the 17th, 18th, 19th century really originated more like the nexus contracts view. It, it was more embedded in a partnership kind of structure where if you were starting up a business and it was kind of called a corporation, the investors, even if you weren't involved in management, even if you weren't at the executive level, retained liability for the activities of that institution, just like a partner would in a partnership form. So in other words, your, your stake in that company wasn't easily transferable. You, there wasn't a lot of liquidity assigned to your ownership in a stunt company, even though you didn't have a lot of control at the management level. Um, so that, that, that original corporation was actually a bit like the Nexus of Contracts view, but the evolution since then has been very, very different. So we've moved from this kind of uh, liability based kind of organization to a limited liability structure where obviously shareholders aren't on the hook for the misdeeds of the corporate entity. They, they will of course be subject to the loss of their investment if the company gets in trouble, but they're not responsible for any of the kind of big risks, any of the kind of externalities that the corporation might impose on society, on other people. So uh, what Patty Ireland says is it's interesting that this nexus of contracts view arose when it did, which is roughly in the late 60s and 70s, um, because he says, historically, we see that the corporation in the 50s and 60s was becoming viewed increasingly as a public institution serving public purpose, public policy objectives, and there was this very strong um, discourse around the corporation uh, as, a, as an equal player with labor, say, and government. And so there was a sense that governments had more potential to kind of influence or uh, direct corporate behavior because of this view that the corporation had this public purpose. Um, so he sees this kind of nexus of contracts view as a kind of uh, a tool to kind of get government out of the picture, to kind of back away from this kind of more corporatist view of the corporation, corporatist in the sense of multiple parties sitting at a table and trying to plan economic outcomes, and, and kind of get government out of, the, out of the picture. And the way you do that is by stressing the contractual nature of the, the relationships within the corporation. If everyone's entering into the corporate uh, realm on equal terms and engaging into these um, arrangements voluntarily, then there's no real place for government to kind of step in and tell people what to do. So that's, that's the kind of core idea. And then he contrasts that view with what he calls the property, rentier, or distributional view, which he says that is probably a better reflection of how the corporation evolved and into its current form. And that, that property, rentier view, essentially sees that a lot of the legal changes around the corporate structure, the move to limited liability, uh, the personhood of the corporation, those kind of legal changes really served to advance the interests of a growing middle class who had excess income to invest and wanted the liquidity of investing in companies where they could kind of easily get out of the corporation if they wanted to. No residual liability from that investment. The other kind of part of that story that's also important to stress is of course the, the move to limited liability coincided with uh, increasing investment uh, needs and the big, big investment needs like railroads, laying uh, telegraph wires under the ocean, high risk endeavors where there was obviously a real risk of, of kind of losing your shirt if you kind of got too heavily invested in these institutions. So this is a kind of contrasting view that um, he says, Patty Ireland says, is probably a, a more accurate reflection of the evolution of the corporate form and it really stresses that more distributional role of the entity rather than the um, kind of market structure or the uh, contract structure that the other view stresses. So one, uh, given limited time, one kind of solution that he suggests that I think is kind of interesting for addressing some of the misbehaviors, the misdeeds of corporate forms now, and I, I only have it in French here, I'm apologizing, but the société en commandit, this idea that the corporate form, if we want to reconceptualize the corporate form and make it more socially responsible in some sense, we need to kind of bring back that liability onto management. So you'd have this kind of, or the entrepreneurs, you'd have these kind of management class who would have liability for the activities of the institution. And then you'd still have kind of limited liability joint stock investors who, like today, are not on the hook for the misdeeds of the institution. So that, that new structure, if we were to adopt it, would, would put a serious break on some of the kind of, say, speculative activity or the activity we've seen 
in, on Wall Street or even in Canada here, financial services sectors. So that's, that's the basic idea, and it would also change that kind of uh, distributional dynamic that uh, I think um, Mike Veal is pointing to a little bit. Another, another kind of way of thinking about this, and I'm going to link this back to dichotomies in a minute. Another way of thinking about this is another form that I'm intimately familiar with, which is the cooperative form, which uh, generally gets uh, very marginal attention in uh, economics uh, courses. Um, and I think I want to kind of suggest that that's too bad, that's unfortunate, because I think there's some interesting features of this form, that legal features of this form that kind of can lead to some very different behavior. And one of the first things to kind of note is that cooperatives typically have more than one objective. They have more than one idea, that, that they're one purpose. And it's not just about profit maximization. It's also about um, social per goals, environmental goals. And then the economic piece, the financial piece, is really about sustainability. So what do we know about uh, executive pay or corporate pay in cooperatives? Because uh, I'm going to try to keep this tied to that, that inequality theme. Uh, we don't know much. We don't know much about how directors and co cooperatives are, are kind of financed. We don't know how much, how much about how uh, executives are financed. Um, but the anecdotal evidence, and this is a paper I found uh, recently, suggests that they're not paid very much. So I know, for example, the credit union system in the United States, if you're on a board of a large credit union, and there are some very large credit unions in the United States, they get paid nothing. They get this pure volunteer work, and it's legislated that way. Um, so there's that. There's that piece. There we also have, uh, we also know from outside of North America, we know the famous Mondragon cooperative system in Spain, which is one of the biggest kind of corporate entities, if you want to think of it that way, in that country, has a kind of maximum CEO pay or upper management pay to kind of average salaries ratio of nine to one. So they very much cap within the institutional structure to maintain the cohesiveness of that institution, they cap the pay at the upper end of that uh, distribution. So this is, this is a concrete example. This is a worker cooperative, very different than a credit union, which is a, um, a consumer cooperative. But still, you can imagine that structure will enable some of that behavior. And just if you're not familiar with cooperatives, they're simply institutions where the member are, members are owners, and it's one vote per membership. So you don't amass voting capacity, you have one more. It's more like a democracy in that sense, of, like the uh, political democracy. Um, Desjardins is a major financial institution in Canada. It's based in Quebec. Um, they have, uh, they're a huge institution, probably as big as National Bank, for example. If you're Canadian, you'd probably know who they are. They're, they're a really sizable organization. And they have one of the lowest pay differentials between their CEO and staff in the financial services sector. Now I say that, and I think I have to be really candid here, Monique LaRue, who's the CEO, makes $2 million a year. It's not like, um, this is not that compressed of a, of a difference, but there's something going on here that the cooperative form seems to be leading some, some slightly different behavior, at least in some cases. Um, one more chart, and this is from the US, and we don't have these kind of data in Canada, which is something I'm working to, to fix, but that's a slow process. Um, we have uh, data, good data, on, on CEO compensation in credit unions versus banks, and we can do a uh, comparison of banks and credit unions by asset size. And if we look overall, credit unions' average CEO, or sorry, median CEO compensation is considerably lower than for the banking sector. Um, but when you start disaggregating those data and you kind of break it down between small and large, you see an interesting um, trend here. The smaller institutions have, uh, that gap is still pretty significant, but as you get bigger, it's actually uh, changing the cooperative, the credit unions actually end up paying their, their uh, the median, at the median anyway, uh, their CEOs a little more than the banks. Um, so I think that's really interesting because one of the points that uh, Veal raises, one of the, some of the research on, on corporate, the link between corporate structure and, and, and the income inequality issue goes back to size. As corporations get bigger, you, you kind of see more of this um, inequality effect. So you may be seeing some of that in the credit union system as well. One thing to really stress, though, is that the bank numbers don't include um, stock options and grants. And that's something you can't do in a credit union or a cooperative structure. You can't give out stock options and grants because you're not publicly traded. So you don't have that option. It's not out there. So this is when you see the, when you see the credit union number, that's everything, all in. The bank number, not all in. So there is an interesting story here, but I wouldn't want to go too far with it. One thing I, I like to, this is uh, me talking my book a little bit, but this is another chart from um, 
the U.S. showing how the members, the people who actually own these institutions, come out quite well by that structure, and I think this is important to kind of underline. Um, for a variety of financial services products, uh, typically the credit unions either have better rates on savings products, right, higher rates on your savings products, or lower rates on your mortgage or loan products. Now, the fixed rate mortgage, 30-year fixed rate mortgage, is the only category where the credit unions come out a little bit behind. And these are average numbers, um, but still all the same kind of interesting. The last, the last column is former credit unions. These are credit unions that demutualized and became banks, joint stock entities, and you can see that their behavior starts looking more like the bank behavior after that conversion process. So that's kind of interesting, again, that that structure may be driving some of the behavior. So um, this, is, uh, this is, now I want to kind of take this back to, um, I'm going to tie it back to some of the dichotomy issue uh, that's the theme of this conference. So one of the uh, a kind of very common refrain, if you read about cooperative research at all, is that a system based on central direction, so the joint stock company, a sole proprietor firm, a partnership kind of structure, uh, is more efficient than uh, an institution like a cooperative which has this democratic structure built into it. So there's this kind of presumption that, that democratic structures are inherently inefficient in some, some important way. Um, and so that, that idea has really kind of, I think, been uh, at the heart of a, of a very sharp decline in the teaching of cooperatives, about cooperatives and their different behaviors, their different structures in economics. And this is a, a piece that was published in the Cambridge Journal of Economics by a, a friend of mine, Panu Kalmi. He talked, he really documented that decline in textbooks from a pre-war period when cooperatives were very kind of uh, on the scene and prevalent in, in kind of thinking, and then in the post-war period where they essentially disappear. Um, so that's, that, that decline kind of gets manifested in a whole bunch of ways. It gets manifested uh, in policy neglect, policy ignorance, and bad policy, ultimately, I would argue. So now I just want to really quickly tackle uh, a claim that, that these institutions are somewhat less efficient, somehow less efficient because they involve these democratic structures or potentially democratic structures. Uh, there's just this, I've got a kind of long list of research that I can draw on to kind of s refute that claim. Um, but this piece here by Calme and all really looks at European cooperative banks versus joint stock banks and finds that the European cooperative banks were actually more efficient, had fewer loan losses, and generally outperformed joint stock institutions on these kind of very narrow metrics. Uh, this piece by Dessart and her colleagues in France uh, look at the behavior of cooperative banks in that country through two financial crises, uh, crises and compare their relative performance. And when the, we look, compare the most recent crisis with the uh, crisis of the early 90s in France, you see that the co-op banks really performed admirably in the early 90s and struggled dramatically in the recent period. And they make the case that, that the reason for that difference in outcome is because of their, they, they've transitioned from pure, pure co-ops to more of a hybrid kind of co-op structure. And then lastly, this is a piece uh, by Smith and Woodbury uh, that looks at credit union lending in the United States compared to bank lending, and they find that generally the lending behavior is more stable, fewer loan losses, and generally uh, better kind of cre credit adjudication processes are embedded in these credit union structures. So I'm going to skip the next slide in the, in the interest of time, but this is an IMF study that just tells roughly the same story of uh, stability and efficiency. Um, lastly, I mentioned that there's a policy dimension to this. Uh, policymakers, because they don't understand cooperative structures, they don't appreciate them, will often make uh, policy decisions or implement policy that uh, undermines the cooperative structures and disadvantages cooperatives relative to joint stock institutions. So one example of that that I'm very familiar with from my work is there's an incredible push now in Ottawa, in Canada, probably outside the country as well, to kind of, I'd call it commoditized loan products, to kind of compel, uh, standardize the, the, the underwriting process that goes into lending and um, that process, that, that kind of regulatory structure inv invariably undermines the kind of cooperative credit process because the cooperative structures are much local, much more local, much more lending based on reputation, based on call community, based on knowledge of the community, and that kind of thing. So when you kind of basically outlaw the use of so soft information, these kind of intangible, unquantifiable information additions, you essentially undermine 
the cooperative credit model, which is to be local and to kind of leverage that knowledge of community that's not really easily um, quantified. So that's, uh, that's really where I want to go and I want to kind of conclude by saying what are these some, some of these false and true dichotomies that I kind of briefly alluded to earlier on. Um, so a false dichotomy within the kind of corporate versus cooperative structure would be uh, to say that the, there's a trade-off between equity and efficiency, between focusing on um, strictly profit maximization, that's going to, the idea that that's going to get you the best outcome, and somehow having more democratic structures where you think of other things than profit maximization is going to lead to some inefficiency. I think there's good evidence to suggest that's not the case. I think there's also evidence that somehow that the idea that there's this dichotomy between regulations and the market, something that was broached um, in some earlier sessions, is not very helpful either. Again, if I look at uh, mortgage lending in Canada, it's very clear to me that government's trying to structure the loan market to kind of facilitate securitization and to facilitate covered bond issues and all these kind of other lending or marketization of products that again kind of eat away at the cooperative uh, structure. And so in terms of true dichotomies, I think there is a real true tension between this nexus of contract view and the property view. I think there's a real tension between um, a société en commun zit kind of proposal and the co corporate form today, and there's a real tension between cooperative structures and corporate structures as, as they stand today. So I'm going to stop there and uh, take questions for the panel. Thank you. Uh, it's Marshall Lauer back from INET. It's uh, my question is directed to uh, Ross McKittrick. So, just um, I'm curious to know what kinds of um, policies at this point you would like to see introduced, say, by the Ontario government or by a, a, a typical G7 government, um, to um, uh, ensure that we do get this um, equitable, uh, these the, the benefits of environmentalism are spread out more equitably. I mean, what what would you like to see happen in, uh, in on the on the policy front? Hmm. Um, yeah, this is on. Um, I use the example of the Green Energy Act sort of as a, um, I think it's, it's a typical implementation of, of subsidies for wind and solar energy that a lot of countries have, have gone in for. And so my thinking is more in terms of what I don't like about that. Um, I guess my default would have been I didn't see any great pressure as of 2009 for a big change in the current, in the policy mix as it stood. I mean. There are some things that were being tweaked uh, to make it a bit more efficient. So we have a, a vehicle inspection system which gets dirty old cars off the road by forcing them to be inspected. And um, when that was first brought in, um, much newer cars had to be inspected as well as, as old cars. And, and then they found um, that that was more or less a waste of money and, and there was no need to inspect them until they reached a certain age limit. And so those were just kind of small changes that were um, meaning that you reduce the cost, but you still got pretty much all the benefits of the policy. With regard to uh, the power plants, um, the uh, owner of the power plants, Ontario PowerGen, had spent about $300 million at that point on a retrofit to put stack gas controls on them, and they uh, had reduced the um, conventional air pollution emissions pretty substantially to the point where um, they could get another 20 years out of them running at a very um, uh, very clean operating level for, for that type of power plant and, and then retire them or convert them to natural gas or something uh, at that point. Um, so I just thought that trajectory that we were on was, was adequate for um, as a, a, an air quality policy and I wouldn't have seen a great need for a huge disruption to our energy grid and, and and the kind of radical changes that were, were, were undertaken. I'd like to um, add to the response, if that's okay. And yeah, the, yeah. Uh, because um, I've spent eight years of my life working in the Ontario Ministry of the Environment, uh, four years as a, an economist in the 70s, and then uh, four years as an assistant deputy minister in the 90s. So I have a, a sort of an unusually privileged view of, of 
how that policy was made. So I want to make a couple of comments on, on what Russ has said. I really uh, applaud the emphasis on equity, so I have no quarrel with him there. But I will say a couple of things. One is the government did fund uh, quite an extensive benefit-cost study of the closure of the coal-fired plants. And interestingly enough, the RDI firm that you cited up there was a contributor to that study. And what the study looked at was um, if you close the plants, you reduce the emissions. It was particularly particulates that turned out to be the most important. Uh, RDI did, the, uh, did some of the work on, on, on the trans transmission of, uh, of, the, uh, of the pollutants. And then there was a health study done on what would be the, the health gains. And it was quite significant. We're talking about quite a substantial reduction in health risks. And so they did, they did, they did do that kind of study. The second thing I want to say is, and I, I maybe I want to get Russ's reaction to this. Um, Toronto GTA has experienced considerable population growth, energy use growth over the time period that he's looking at. And so I think there's an argument that you maintain air quality by, by, increasing, by imposing increasingly stringent requirements on each source, because that's, that's what you have to do when the number of sources is rising. So I think um, it's not it's a bit more complicated than just looking at what we were doing okay, maybe we didn't have to do any more. When you've got an expanding economy all the time, you have to keep becoming more stringent in environmental regulation just to stand still. And I think that's another interpretation of what we were shown. Um, I, I, with respect to the, yeah, the cost-benefit analysis, um, I know you were involved with DSS consultants that wrote part of that, so, and I've read it very carefully, but bear in mind, you guys didn't look at wind energy. I mean, it doesn't figure anywhere in the cost-benefit analysis. You were looking at coal, gas, and nuclear, and different mixes of those. So, um, and the, uh, the health costs, there's a big difference between the 2003 version, 2005 version, which um, even if you go with the 2005 numbers, you would never have justified the investment in wind energy because the, the total benefits are still fairly small compared to the cost of even just the Samsung deal, but add in the global adjustment and all the other costs that have gone under power bills. Yeah, I think I just wanted to make the point, though, that there was some evidence that closure of the coal plants would yield very significant environmental and health benefits. That's all. I, I, you're quite right about the scope of the study, but nonetheless, there were some very significant gains to be had from closing the plants. Okay, I think we have a question over here. Yeah, Antoine Mandel from University of Paris. I'm also partly involved with some research institute, which is called the Global Climate Forum. It seems to me that I, I totally uh, be ocean on uh, you know, Canadian energy system, but that you're criticizing or bashing this uh, policies on, uh, from the point of view of their inefficiency in terms of local air quality, but, but they're also tied to, let's say, uh, greenhouse gases, emissions, and possibly to energy transitions. For example, in, there, in Germany, they are massively investing into wind energy not, uh, certainly not, well, I mean, in order to, to foster, to create new industrial, uh, new industries and so on, and to, to prepare for a transition to a cleaner form of energy, not, and uh, with greenhouse gas emission, I was central focus. I mean, it seems to me that uh, you didn't talk about that, and this is an important uh, aspect. Is um, well, I could criticize them as an inefficient approach to greenhouse gases as well. Um, in England, for instance, um, where there's been a lot of investment in greenhouse gases, that isn't in response to the um, emission prices on greenhouse gases. So if, if you look for the efficient responses to greenhouse gas emissions, those would be the responses that people make when they start having to pay for greenhouse gas emissions. But uh, the, the power sector in England has said there's no way they're going to invest, even in nuclear plants, much less wind energy, just in response to the uh, the floor price on carbon emissions. They require huge subsidies in addition to that. And that's an indication that it's, it's an inefficient mode of responding. The other problem in Ontario is, is uh, the whole wind energy sector doesn't reduce greenhouse gases. You need to have additional gas plants running when you have the wind energy sector because the wind levels fluctuate. The power grid can't cope with a constant up and down fluctuation every time the wind changes. So you have fossil fuel powered, fired power plants making up that difference. And um, one of my colleagues at Guelph, uh, Talat Gench, has done very detailed modeling of, of the role of wind on the energy sector, on the energy mix in Ontario. 
and only at low levels of introduction of wind energy do you get uh, some reductions, but they're not even all that much. But once you cross a certain threshold, the more wind you add, the more greenhouse gases you're getting because you need additional uh, fossil fuel powered, fired generators. And then another point that the Ontario uh, Professional Engineering Association is trying to warn the provincial government uh, about is once we get to the next target level, the additional base load from wind will be so much that they'll need to take a nuclear power plant offline because we'll have too much base load power in Ontario. Uh, if you take a, a nuclear power plant offline and then you add in a mix of wind and gas to compensate for that, we'll have a big up step, step up in our greenhouse gas emissions. So even if you thought there were some reductions coming on greenhouse gases from wind energy, uh, they're coming at a very high marginal cost, and it's not even clear that they actually reduce greenhouse gases. We can just walk the microphone over. Thank you. Nancy O'Weiler, Simon Fraser University. Um, bad policy is stupid no matter what. I mean, this is just another nail in the coffin of uh, policies written on cocktail napkins when a minister is uh, flying back from Europe which is the anecdotal story of the green energy uh, policies in Ontario. I'm from British Columbia, and we were uh, terrified that our, uh, our guys would want to catch up with Ontario and do ridiculous feed-in tariffs. So, I mean, I, I guess one of the, the issue is how do we convince decision makers to not go with the flavor of the week and to do the kind of cost-effectiveness stuff, number one, and do the equity question, issue, number two, and I, I ask that to both of you or all of you, I mean, how do you get regulations that, that represent the kinds of things you're talking about? But Ross, on your thing, I'm, I'm interested if you've done it at a more disaggregated basis, the, the work at, at the local air pollution level, because I, I remember back, uh, and, and maybe air quality has improved enough that there aren't neighborhood effects, but you know, the poor people always live downwind of the factories. The rich people can afford to live upwind of the factories. So even if, if you go down from a provincial average wide to something that is more local and also takes into account the episodic, you know, the episodes of air quality, it's not just the, I mean, the average can be coming down. We can still have, you know, high peaks on, as you say, with ground level ozone and some of those other days. So have you looked at all at locations to say that you know, in aggregate, we're we're all better off, or we've still got people of low income levels that are being more subject to environmental contaminants, which may be benefited by you know smart policy, not the stupid policies. And I'm thinking not just of air quality, but water quality in in rural areas where people depend on groundwater. Uh, and they happen to be in an area, oh, let's talk about fracking in northeast British Columbia or somewhere where their groundwater may be affected. So, uh, you know, I just wondered if you've, if you've thought about it at that level. And then, Peter, the question is, <coughs> if you look at Ross's stuff in terms of income inequality, how does that square with, with low growth environments? In other words, what would you do to address the income e inequality trade-off? Um, yeah, with respect to local effects, um, uh, each air contaminant is, is a different story there. Um, the, um, I think right now the major concern would be high traffic areas, motor vehicle related emissions, because there you do have a concentration of housing uh, in the same place as a, a large concentration of sources. And um, the management there, if, if there's some way of dealing with the traffic problem, go that route. If not, there's ways of putting up physical barriers and, and banks of trees and so on to try to reduce the effects that way. Um, but in uh, managing uh, the air emissions, I think for one thing, we have a lot less manufacturing in cities now. And we don't, um, Peter maybe correct me on this, but I don't think there are any major power plants in Toronto anymore. I think they've all uh, moved uh, out of the city, and um, uh, the um, with ozone formation, as I mentioned, it's uh, uh, it's not really something that you can think about at the local level, just because it it uh, is based on the local chemistry and and can easily be uh, at least in Ontario, it's typically a worse problem in rural areas than in cities. Um, 
With water quality, I think the big concern in Ontario is the localized problems of agricultural runoff and the, um, uh, the effects downstream of, of agricultural areas. And um, so there you have uh, the tricky management problems of trying to get farmers signed up, but it's a non-point source uh, problem and it's hard to maintain compliance. And um, But at least with, with water quality, uh, I was going to say at least it's measured. Um, unfortunately, the, there's no waterqualityontario.com website that people can look at it. The numbers are collected regularly, but um, people don't have access to that data. So, um, so that's something I've been working on. I have some funding from my university to try to create a website where people get regular updates on local water quality so they can see what's going on in their own area. But um, uh, there, I, uh, at least where I am uh, over in Guelph, the major water quality concern is the agricultural runoff. I just like the way uh, Nancy sort of threw it in at the end. Oh, by the way, and what about inequality in the context of low or no growth? Um, of course, it has to be uh, factored in very significantly. I think that when you start contemplating an economy that doesn't depend upon growth and doesn't judge its success by growth, what you have to come to terms with is that you can't sort of put off the question of inequality by saying, well, it doesn't matter because we'll all get richer. Well, two things on that. One is that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. It hasn't been the case for quite a while. Some of the data that we've seen here and in other, other presentations show that um, the increase in GDP in many developed countries has been concentrated in the, uh, in the hands of a very small proportion of the population. So, um, but that doesn't solve the problem that you, you've asked. I think the, I think the, the um, merit of talking about uh, what would happen if we weren't dependent upon growth in the same way is that you have to take on these other issues uh, in a way that is refreshing. You, ha you can't just say, well, we've, you know, we're going to deal with it through some mechanism that, in fact, hasn't been very successful for a while. And funnily enough, I think that links a little bit to the discussion of co-ops, because I don't think we've just got a, an income distribution problem. We have a wealth distribution problem. And so then what we're talking about is how do you change the pattern of ownership of assets in the, in, in, in the economy? And I think um, you know, the, these are very profound political questions as much as they are economic. And it's, it's, uh, it's obviously very relevant to the notion of false dichotomies. Um, so the first thing, you know, to me the first thing to do is to understand the predicament we're in, which is why I do the big picture stuff. And uh, I, I appreciate the commentary on, on the, the pros and cons of how well local environmental policy is done. I think actually the general pattern has been quite a good success story. That's why you're seeing some of those good results. But we're not doing anything like that um, in terms of the bigger picture. However, whatever measure, metrics you use for that. And so we're very bad at making policy at the, uh, at the global level. And the question of inequality uh, becomes so much more significant then. Um, I heard a presentation a few days ago on, on climate change, and you know, the, the presenter said, look, we know, we know the answer. Well, I was all ears, but we know the answer. The answer is the rich countries have to cut um, their uh, greenhouse gas emissions, I think he said something like 40% in 20 years. Uh, poorer countries have to stop increasing greenhouse gas emissions, um, but not to stop growth, and therefore any increase in energy supplies have to come from renewable sources. They can't afford to pay for that. It has to be paid for by the rich countries. The only trouble is it's not a politically viable platform. Uh, but I mean, he said, so, so we know what the answer is. We just have, haven't got the faintest idea how to get there. But you know, unless we tackle an, the, the question of inequality through redistribution, through redesigning our institutions so that um, um, ownership doesn't continue to get concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, uh, we won't solve the problem. And looking at it within the context of, of no growth, at least no growth in terms of use of uh, the, the planet's resources on an annual basis, uh, we will not solve the problem. But I don't have a magic solution. Yeah, have a question. Can I just add one more comment to what I was saying since I was had a little bit of a flow? Um, and again, I, I, it, 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 it's, it, it's about this question of inequality. We are anticipating, we, the broad community of scientists who look at Im impacts of, of climate change, that um, 
the worst effects will be felt in the poorest countries. I mean, so there's a major concern about inequality on the environmental impact side that um, is as important, if not more important, than the question of the economic resources that go along with it. Um, can I add a, a point to that, um, which I think needs to be borne in mind, is under the scenarios where you do have big effects, uh, and, and you're right, some of them are on poorest countries in, in the tropics where they're already susceptible to drought and so on, but under the scenarios where the impacts are large, you get large impacts because of rapid growth in emissions that result from big increases in income in those districts. So the scenarios are driven by a strong convergence assumption in income. And um, even the high-end warming scenarios, uh, like the A1FI scenario, um, at the end of the century, at 2100, the assumption is that there will have been so much economic growth that per capita income in those countries will be about three times the current average per capita income in industrialized countries. So yes, you have big impacts, but you're offsetting the, the cost of those impacts against a much higher income base. So if we look at it from an equity point of view, I'm not sure if the current income distribution that we have today would be the same as the income distribution at 2100 under those scenarios. All right, any last questions before we call it a day? All right, so I think we'll break there. Thank you. Thanks,